It was on a summer's day in 1970 that my mother invited my three siblings and myself to go on a picnic with her. I wasn't able to resist the red lemonade and ham sandwiches, so eagerly I said yes. We went on a 20-minute drive to a wood outside the village of Monave in County Galway. When we got to the centre of the woods, we immediately jumped out of the car and started to play. We had our picnic beside this mausoleum, plonked right in the middle of the wood. This was what my mother had come to see. She told us the story about the two people laid to rest in this mausoleum. Robert Percy French and his daughter Kathleen French. I remember my mother talking about the countries they had lived in, like Russia and China, and also cities in Europe like Vienna and Paris. My mother had a fascination for the history of families who lived in big houses. But what caught my attention was this grave. I thought it was a sad and forlorn place to be buried, why wasn't this woman, Rosamond, buried inside with her family? Was she family? Who was she? She had the same name. It was strange. My mother said she was a cousin of those in the mausoleum, but this didn't seem to answer all the questions I had. I remember I didn't enjoy the day despite the picnic. The whole place felt eerie. It was said in the village that Rosamond wasn't at rest, and that's how I felt about it. That feeling never went away. 25 years later, I started researching this story because I wanted to try and cheer my mother up. Her health hadn't been good, and I had drifted away from her as well. I also wanted to understand this curious burial arrangement. When I saw her smiling when she saw the research, I knew I was on the right track. However, she died two years later, so I decided then to make this documentary. Well, I think there's much to do about nothing. Uh, I think that people locally are behaving in a very provincial way about it. If they don't like her, they needn't go, and uh, it would be much better to ignore her if they don't like her than start up such a great fuss. And in any case, I don't think she's all that of a danger. And there are quite a lot of distasteful things in Ireland that are just as distasteful as James Mansfield. And uh, we hear very little about them. They, they get a social acceptance. Uh, it's all a little bit prudish, I think. That was my mother. You'd want to be in good form to take her on. She was articulate, intelligent, and definitely not shy. She was born in 1930 and was the oldest of seven children. Her parents brought them up in the small town of Swinford in County Mayo. After secondary school, she went on to university in Galway, where she got a degree in history, English and French. While she was there, she met Donald Murray. They got married in 1955, and when we eventually settled in Galway, she started teaching full-time. It was during her first summer holidays there that we went to the mausoleum on our picnic. So, who were the Frenches? They were originally Norman, but settled here at Monavay Castle over 400 years ago. Rosamond French was the last resident at Monavay Castle. She was born in 1866 and lived with her parents and her younger sister Nina. My picture of her has been rather a large person, wearing tweeds, long tweed jacket, and a hat. Always wore a hat in the house as well as outside, which was a fashion in those days. This awful wheezy cough, and the cigarettes. And making, I would be a little girl with elderly grandparents. I think she made a fuss of me, was sweet to me, and uh, talked to me. But I, I really can't remember much more about it than that, that I was happy with her. You know, when a child knows when somebody likes them or loves them, it makes a great difference. 
and that's why I always I remember Roz and as somebody I could have been very fond of. Herself and the old Queen Mary, they call her, they, they were personal friends. And they used to correspond, I understand, on a regular basis. And uh, when King George died, she wrote uh, a letter of uh, sympathy to the Queen. Rosamond's uncle, Robert Percy French, was the last male heir of Monavé. He didn't like the idea of being a country squire, so he opted instead for a career with the British Diplomatic Service. He was a diplomat, he had status, he was free to do whatever he liked. To have mistresses, to travel, he mixed with the crowned heads of Europe. While he was working in St. Petersburg, he met a Russian heiress, Sophie de Kindiakov. They got married in 1863, and soon after, their only child, Kathleen, was born. She would inherit the Monovay estate from her father, and also six estates in central Russia from her mother. Rosamond and Kathleen met for the first time when Kathleen visited Monovay in 1878. Rosamond showed her around the house and the old castle grounds. Kathleen was a young girl. She was just only a tiny bit older than Rosamond. Nina was a little bit younger. They had a very, very happy time together. And they became firm friends. However, the friendship that Rosamond and Kathleen had wasn't going to last, even though both loved Monavé and both were to be converts to the Catholic Church. A few months later, Kathleen returned home after her visit. Home was Kindiakovka, an estate just outside the city of Simbirsk on the banks of the River Volga in Russia. Nothing remains of the house in Kindiakovka, but a house she owned still stands today 50 kilometers south in a place called Turenga. It still holds the ghosts of the people who lived here long ago. My mother would have loved this house had she seen it. It survived a revolution and 75 years of communist rule. Despite being the worst for wear, it still holds a certain elegance. My mother would have wondered about Kathleen and the Kindiakovs. What kind of people were they? What kind of lives did they have? Did they entertain in their big house? If so, who came? How did they dress? What kind of music was played? Who played? Where did they dance? Kathleen was delighted to be back again with her Russian grandparents, Emily and Alexander Kindiakov. They had reared her from the age of two when her parents had separated. She was also pleased to see her mother there, but her delight would not last long. Sophie was a very unhappy woman. We know that she took morphine, which was the social drug of the time. Sophie had a history of depression and histrionics throughout her life. My mother had depression as well. When she recovered from a particularly bad bout, it dawned on her that being a housewife wasn't helping her. She wasn't able or interested in doing housework or being at home with four young children. So it was then she decided to go teaching. There were times when she found the going tough, but she did hold her job down for over 20 years. Looking back, I can see how much she needed to do this, but back then I was upset that she wasn't around. I remember very clearly deciding I was on my own and that I wasn't going to rely on her anymore. Now I see I was a young child who was missing his mother. Because of her mother's problems, Kathleen had to take over the running of the estates at the young age of 19. It wasn't a good time to do so because the estates were in debt and added to that, her father had become seriously ill. Kathleen was a worried woman now. She was worrying about the estates, worrying about her mother and also worrying about her father. In 1896, her beloved father, Robert Percy, died in Naples from tuberculosis at the age of 63. Kathleen was with him when he died. 
that was terrible for Kathleen. Now, she she was very close to her father, and it was real. It was she must have been very very sad. The love she had for her father can be seen in the expense and effort she made to have this mausoleum built. It took four years to be completed and cost £10,000 or €1 million Euro in today's money. Her father's remains were then brought back and laid to rest in the mausoleum. Then her mother, Sophie de Kindikov, died the following year. As well as being sad, Kathleen would have been relieved to some extent as well. Their relationship, which was never great and often troublesome, was now over. So being freed to concentrate on running her Russian estates, they improved quite quickly, but she was helped in no small way by the money she got from the sale of land in Monave. This didn't go down well with Rosamond, particularly as she had become caretaker of the Monave estate around this time. This meant that the two cousins were now on a collision course. Life even got good for Kathleen, so much so she even became a patron of the arts, building this memorial in honour of a local writer. However, it was the calm before the storm. A close neighbour of hers was about to lead a revolution that was to overthrow the powers that be in Russia. His name was Vladimir Ilyich Olyanov, otherwise known to us as Lenin. My mother was in Russia in 1991 when the attempted coup against Mikhail Gorbachev happened. She and her fellow travellers heard about a big protest out on the streets while staying in a hotel in St. Petersburg. Despite the warnings, they joined the protesters and on their way back ended up in a bar singing Irish revolutionary songs for their Russian comrades. Meeting her at the airport when she came home, I could see by the glint in her eyes how thrilled and excited she was to have been at the centre of an attempted Russian coup. There was also a revolution in Ireland in the early 1900s, but Rosamond managed to keep the estate safe. However, she was also getting more and more concerned for Kathleen, as she hadn't heard anything from her in quite a while. The reason she hadn't heard from her was because Kathleen had been arrested by the Bolsheviks. After confiscating all her lands and properties, they first held her as a prisoner in her own home, and then later in prisons both in Simbirsk and Moscow. Thinking they would not dare to touch one. Not as a British subject or as an elected president of the Red Cross. Then one night, when I least expected it, I was seized and arrested. Three months later, my soul was in agony, with the thought of those hounds desecrating my home. Then news came that Kathleen had been released from prison and was trying to get her lands back. She had even got in touch with her old neighbour, Lennon, to see if he could help, but all he said was he could do nothing. Then Rosamond heard that Kathleen had managed to escape from Russia and was heading for Monave. When she arrived, Rosamond was glad and relieved to see her, but that was to change quite quickly. Kathleen wanted to start her life as she'd had it before and didn't realise how much had changed in Ireland. She said at the time, Little did I realise that when I left one revolution, I would be met by another. Well, OK, did she have sort of grand ideas that she was coming back from... She was living in fair good style away and came back and expected the same. But she must have been quite a stupid woman if she couldn't see that the times had changed and changed for everybody, including Roz, and if means weren't there, it was up to her to supply them. This brought her into conflict, not only with Ireland of the 1920s, but also, ultimately, with Rosamond. Realising that living in Monave wasn't going to work, Kathleen left after a year and eventually settled in Harbin in northern China. She was part of a large community of white Russians. They were waiting for law and order to be restored in Russia so that they could go home and reclaim their estates. Needless to say, this didn't happen. The relationship between Kathleen and Rosamond deteriorated over these years. She described Rosamond in a letter as... I have a scorpion at Monavay. 
Rosamond was living in a house that was falling down around her ears. She was witnessing an end to a way of life that wasn't coming back because there was no monies coming from Kathleen. The fate of the house and the estate were sealed and there was nothing anybody could do about it but to accept it. Time passed and on the 1st of January 1938 Kathleen died. It was November before her body was returned from China to Manave, where she was eventually laid to rest with her father. I mean, there were stories about her, first of all, being put in a wooden coffin and it fell apart and she had to be rehoused in a lead coffin and all this. I mean, this is a story we heard over the dining room table, you know. Rosamond attended the funeral as the chief mourner. We laid her poor body to rest beside her father on Thursday after her storm-tossed life and last long journey of nine weeks from Harbin. The funeral was private, so only those who wanted to come were there. John Blake, de Stackpools, tradespeople and two dear friends of mine. All the arrangements were quite successful, quite simple and dignified. Kathleen never mentioned Rosamond in her will. This caused a storm for the 70-year-old Rosamond. Newspapers wanted to know why was there division within the family. Rosamond denied the family rift, preferring to show family unity by praising Kathleen for her courage and bravery over the years. However, she did decide to contest Kathleen's will, and the court found in her favour, but unfortunately for Rosamond, she died around this time. So then, the estate and the contents of the house were sold off. But 30 years later, Rosamond's share of these monies ended up going to the poor of the parish of Tume, which included Monavay. This was done at her behest. Her legacy was in keeping with her sense of Christian duty and also her sense of obligation of being the last French to live at Monavay Castle. The house was knocked shortly afterwards, the woods were cut down for fuel, the gardens disappeared, and now really all that is left is the castle ruin, the mausoleum and the grave, Rosa's grave. Why then was she buried here? What was she trying to say from the grave? I had thought she was not at rest because she was not treated well. It seemed to me to be a forlorn setting. Where was her family? Well. Her family were buried in the Protestant graveyard, and as she was a Catholic, she couldn't be buried there. She was the last tenant of Monave, so to be buried on the estate made sense. But why here? Maybe it was solidarity instead of the division that I had suspected. Who really knows? What of my own personal interest? I was glad to see my mother smile when she saw my research, but now, since finishing the film, I'm also grateful for having a better understanding of the kind of woman she was. She wasn't always around. She wasn't a housewife, but she was a great history teacher and a loving mother. She gave me a love of storytelling and an appetite for life.